Okay, good morning, my teachers, professors, colleagues. Today I will be presenting the Bada two flap palatoplasty technique under the following outline. Now, orofacial clefts are common craniofacial anomalies. It's the second most common congenital anomaly, second only to club foot. Cleft palate is one of the presentations of official clefts, and it may occur as an isolated defect or in conjunction with the cleft of the lip or with other congenital anomalies or even part of the syndrome, such as the periorbing sequence of bone heart syndrome. It may be complete or incomplete, or may have unilateral or bilateral presentations. The prevalence of cleft lip uh, and palate varies worldwide according to geographical location. Isolated cleft palate has a reported incidence of about 1.3 to 25.3 per 10,000 live breaths. A nationwide study conducted by Butali et al. reported a prevalence of 0 0.5 per 1,000 live births with um, a female predominance in uh, isolated clefts of the palate. Other local studies by Deshina et al. and Ibrahim et al. have reported anomalies associated with uh, clefts in general, especially isolated clefts of the palate. The first documented successful cleft palate repair was performed by a Parisian dentist named Lemonnier. And over the years, flap palatoplasties existing in various mod modifications have become quite popular. Some of the notable to flap repair techniques include the von Lagenberg technique, the Vu or the Kional technique, and the Badak to flap palatoplasty techniques. Now, Badak was a Polish Jew, a plastic surgeon who, whose father coincidentally was a dentist named Mark Badak. He first described the two-flap palatoplasty technique in 1967 in Polish and was later transcribed to English literature. This technique is a modification and extension of previously existing uh, two-flap techniques that use the nasal and oral mucoperiosal flaps uh, to achieve closure of the palatal cleft. However, like the Vos technique, this technique is hinged on a posteriorly based in a pedicle flaps which derive their main blood supply from the greater palatine artery. Detailed knowledge of anatomy of the palate is therefore very essential in executing this technique uh, safely. The technique allows for complete closure of the palatal clefts and gives access for precise dissection of the muscles of the soft palate while allowing increased mobility of the palatal flaps as well as, as well as some degree of lengthening, lengthening of the of the soft palate. Uh, this is just the surface anatomy of the palate. You can see the hard palate and the soft palate. The incisive papillae here overlying uh, the incisive foramen which separates the premaxillary segment from the secondary palate. And let's look at the anatomy of the soft palate. It comprises the vel velopharyngeal muscles which are necessary for swallowing and speech. Now, velar closure occurs as a result of the synergistic action of three muscle slings. The levator sling, the palatopharyngeals and the superior constrictor muscle slings. Now, the levator vena palatini is the principal muscle responsible for velar closure during speech. This muscle takes its origin from the petrous temporal bone anteromedial to the anterior uh, to the carotid canal, as depicted 
in this picture and passes on to inferiorly under the cartilaginous uh, lip of the eustachian tube before entering the soft palate where it forms a sling with the same muscle from the other side. You can see that. I hope you can see my cursor. You can see that sling over there. Now, when this muscle contracts, it retracts the velum posteriorly and superiorly to contact the posterior wall of the nasopharynx, while also narrowing the aperture of the uh, pharynx from either side. The palatopharyngeal muscle originates from the thyroid cartilage and the adjacent and lateral pharynx and passes posterior to the tonsil, forming what we know as the posterior tonsillar pillar before it enters the soft palate. Now, this muscle sling formed by the palatopharyngeal pulls the velum inferiorly and posteriorly and, and makes up the posterior tonsillar pillar. The superior constrictor muscle takes its origin from the hamular process of the medial pterygoid and the pterygomandibular raphe. And this contraction of this muscle sling in conjunction with some fibers from the palatopharyngeus pulls the posterior pharyngeal wall anteriorly. So, if I'm to summarize what I've just said, um, we have two muscle slings responsible for um, pulling the velum posteriorly, that is, the levator muscle sling and the palatopharyngeal muscle sling. And then the, we have the superior constrictor muscle sling, which pulls it anteriorly. So the synergistic action of these muscles um, re, re, um, results in velar closure. A brief look at the vascular supply of the palate, the hard palate gets its major blood supply from the greater palatine artery um, posteriorly and the phenopalatine artery anteriorly uh, with uh, numerous anastomotic links with various um, arteries as depicted in the picture above. The soft palate gets its major blood supply from the ascending palatine artery. Also, it has numerous anastomotic um, branches uh, connection with the palatine artery. The function of the soft palate, the soft palate is quite dynamic in structure. It separates the O and the nasopharynx and also acts as a valve between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx, which is essential for normal speech uh, and feeding. Let us briefly compare a normal palate, the anatomy of a normal palate with that of a cleft palate. Now in the cleft palate, the anterior portions of the levator veni palatini, I hope you can see my cursor here, and the longitudinal portions of the palatopharyngeal muscles, they are synergistically interwoven. And uh, Victor Vo did a very good job of describing that and named it after himself in 1931 as the Vos cleft muscle. Now, this muscle is abnormally inserted into the posterior edge of the heart palate. Now, this finding is the basis for nearly every intravenous veloplasty performed at present time. And the hallmark of that procedure is complete dissection of this abnormal muscle insertion from the posterior edge of the heart palate in an effort to transpose this vos cleft muscle posteriorly and medially to form a sling. In addition, we have um, transverse displacement of muscular insertions, all, but the muscle origins are all normal. The muscular origins are normal, but you have um, abnormal insertions of the muscles of the soft, soft palate. Also, you have an altered insertion of the hypoplastic tendon of the tensor veli palatini. This is the tensor veli palatini here, hooking around the hamulus of the, um, hooking ar around the pterygoid hamulus and attaching abnormally into the heart palate. If you look at the normal palate on the, on the left, you would see 
the normal anatomy hooks around and is supposed to decussate with the the tendon of the contralateral side to form a tensor aponeurosis in the midline. But this is not so uh, in the cleft palate. Also, you have an abnormal relationship between the aponeurosis of the of the tensor very uh, palatini and the vose cleft muscle composed of your levator and your palatopharyngeus muscles. You have abnormal fibrous attachments um, between these two muscles which must be separated at surgery to get uh, good mobilization of your sensor valley palatini. Management of the cleft palate patient is interdisciplinary and follows the protocol like all other cleft patients. Uh, the timing for cleft palate um, management is variable depending on surgical protocol. In our center, we, we, we time uh, between 9 to 12 months in order to um, get a repair of the palate before speed development and also to minimize the effects of um, dissection and surgical procedure on the growth of the maxilla. A good and thorough preoperative evaluation is necessary before any palatoplasty. Most children with clefts, however, are otherwise healthy, but in some cases, where the, there is a cleft palate, you, 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 it might be part of a syndrome, and attention has to be paid to comorbidities involving especially the heart uh, or kidneys. Uh, children with um, cleft palates also have feeding problems, and so they are prone to chronic aspiration and pulmonary compromise, and their group may lag behind that of other children. So it's important to rule out um, certain factors during your history and examination. You want to be sure you're not going to run into any airway issues during your surgery. You want to rule out um, micrognathia or glossophosis as in, you find in patients who have variable sequence, which can lead to uh, respiratory obstruction or airway obstruction. Also, patients with enlarged adenoids may also be at risk of respiratory obstruction post palatoplasty. Any history of pneumonia and wheezing, which is usually secondary to aspiration, should also um, be taken. Uh, familiar histories of any issues related to anesthesia uh, should also be taken. And a thorough clinical examination, including examination of all systems is important to rule out any congenital anomalies. It's important to know that cleft palate repair is an elective procedure and if a patient has an acute respiratory infection, it should be treated prior to surgery. Therefore, this should be ruled out prior to surgery uh, because chronic aspiration may predispose to pneumonia or reactive airway disease and ideally, you should schedule your, your elective surgery at least four weeks after an acute respiratory infection uh, has occurred. This is because any underlying respiratory disease uh, may predispose to post-operative oxygen needs, increased post-operative oxygen needs, uh, or even bronchospasm in the perioperative period. Any patient with um, cardiac issues would need a pediatric uh, cardiologist consultation, and that should be resolved prior to surgery. ENT consultation is also essential to rule out uh, chronic ear infections or um, also to assess patients who have um, enlarged adenoids. Preoperative laboratory assessment, as indicated in the slides, is essential uh, to make sure your patient is optimal uh, for surgery. The indications. Um, for using a badatu flap palatoplasty uh, is uh, when you have medium to right clefts as referenced by several authors. And Badat describes uh, a medium cleft as any cleft between 1 to 1.5 cm in width. 
and a wide cleft as greater than 1.5 cm. Loskin has also advocated that any palatal clefts greater than 8 millimeters should also um, be repaired using uh, a badak to flap palatoplasty. The objective of closing this procedure is complete closure of the palatal clefts. You want to create a velopharyngeal seal and you want as much as possible to have um, minimal effect on, on maxillary growth. The principles of this procedure, as highlighted by Badak himself in 1995, includes complete closure of the palatal cleft performed in one surgical procedure, a two layered closure of the hard palate and a three layered closure of the soft palate, closure of the palatal cleft with no tension in the area of the hard and soft palate. Of course, a tension free closure prevents dehiscence and urinal fistulas. He also advocated attention to two-layer closure in the anterior portion of the cleft to prevent uronesal fistulas, tight approximation of the mucoperiosal flaps from the nasal and oral layer so as to prevent dead space from occurring between these layers, dissection of the muscles of the soft palate from posterior edge of the hard palate, which allows the soft palate to be lengthened and the muscle sling to be created. He also advocates that you do not enter uh, the Ernst space. Now, the space of Ernst was named after Frank Ernst who discovered it. It's a facial space that separates the superior constrictor muscle from the medial pterygoid. Some authors believe that entering this space risks injury to the nerve supply of the levator veli palatini, which is the pharyngeal branch of the um, vagus nerve. He also advocates construction of a muscular sling, um, which adds to adequate functioning of the soft palate and is essential for normal speech production. In right clefts, when a large area is exposed, he advocates that loose sutures can be used to decrease uh, this area. He has advocated that these following steps should be avoided, transverse incisions of the nasal mucoperistium, and of course, severing the greater palatine neurovascular bundle, which might lead to flap necrosis amongst all others listed. There have been several modifications to these two flap palatoplasty over time. And these have been added with the aim of improving speech outcomes uh, by optimizing the anatomy of the repaired cleft velopharynx. Cutting in his repair incorporated the tensor telucrex into his technique. Now, in this technique, the tendon of the tensor veli palatini is first fixed to the perusum of the pterygoid hamulus, that is the, the tensor tenuplex, using the four vicryl, and then it is released, that is, it is incised to just move down to the hamulus. Now, the rationale for this is modification is that the tensor veli palatini tendon, when transected during palatoplasty, may pose a risk to eustachian tube function. And, um, this risk has also been corroborated by several authors. Slayer also introduced uh, the posterior vomer flap and uvular pad to his uh, two flap palatoplasty. Now, the use of the posterior vomer flap, according to him, recreates um, the posterior journey and tetas develop up to a more functional position, and the uvular pad. Uh, facilitates velopharyngeal closure. Andrea Diz et al. also introduced the concept of radical uh, intravenous veloplasty during his uh, sufla palatoplasty, and he has um, reported that it optimizes speech outcome and may obviate the need for um, secondary speech surgery in future. Now, we'll di discuss the sufla palatoplasty with radical intravenous veloplasty by Andrades et al. It is uh, my favorite two-flap palatoplasty technique. So basically, um, these are the instruments you need for a cleft palate surgery. We'll highlight some of them during the course of the discussion. Now, for this procedure, the patient is positioned Supine on the operating table, general anesthesia is administered via an endotracheal intubation. 
we give uh, antibiotic, antibiotic prophylaxis. And um, the neck of the patient is moderately hyperextended with the aid of the shoulder roll and we stabilize the head with uh, a head ring. Skin prep and draping is usually done in standard fashion and replacing your D-man uh, retractor while ensuring that the endotracheal tube uh, is not moved out of the airway or pushed back into the right uh, main bronchus. And then, of course, you do uh, good throat packing. The placement of the surgical markings for the incision are done after you have done your internal mouth prep with COVID-19 using a sterile surgical pen. Now, what determines placement of these incisions? The width of the cleft and the availability of Vomarium mucosa as in when you are doing um, operating um, a complete uh, bilateral cleft of the palate. Now, the wider the cleft, the wider the strip of mucoperiosum that must be left on the medial edge of the cleft. This is so that um, that will be turned over and used to create a nasal layer to ensure nasal closure without tension. Um, however, if you are, if you are using vomeran flaps for, for your nasal layer repair, you, you can afford to put your incision at the medial edge of the cleft. Surgical marking for the lateral incision is made bilaterally, just lingual to the alveolar ridge, and you connect both, both markings anteriorly, as shown uh, in the diagram above, creating rounded tips of the flap. Uh, you do infiltration using um, a, uh, a adrenaline containing solution. We use 2% uh, lignocaine in 100,000 adrenaline and observe a seven minute phase to allow for visual constriction uh, to take place. Now, once that is done, you can make your lateral uh, relax, relaxing incisions. You can either use uh, a 15 blade or a collateral tip, and this incision is made full thickness uh, down. Uh, to bone and it extends along the groove at the junction of the palatal shelf and the alveolar processes. You continue this incision to around the maxillary tuberosity. Uh, Subperiosal undermining is then carried out from the lateral incision by insertion of uh, an elevator. You can use a wood scene by slipping it in between the bone and the perisium until it reaches the middle edge of the cleft. Now, the incision along the cleft margin can be made using a 15 blade, surgeon scissors, or a beaver's blade, uh, depending on your preference. And that separates the oral mucosa from the nasal line. This incision is usually carried down to bone in the region of the heart palate and is limited to a mucosa incision in the region of the soft palate. We usually make this incision from the anterior extent of the cleft to the tip of the uvula. While making all these incisions, care must be taken not to traumatize bone or any underlying two buds, uh, especially when you are using um, Colorado, Colorado tip electropotry. Now, the mucoperiosal flaps are raised in the anterior thirds and middle thirds of the palate um, using your perusal elevator. But once you have come across these palatal spines, it means you are getting very close to the greater palatine foramen. Um, at this stage, blunt dissection should be done using um, peanuts mounted on an artery forceps to, um, to raise the posterior third of the flap until you visualize the greater palatine uh, neovascular bundle. So, dissection is continued until you expose the posterior edge of the heart palate and the abnormal attachments of the muscles of the, of the soft palate, as depicted in the picture uh, above. Now, at this stage, um, in the right cleft, flap mobilization might be essential to achieve a tension-free closure.
the greater palatine artery enters the palate from the greater palatine foramen. And this artery is surrounded by an extension of the perosteum close to its exit from the greater palatine foramen. This coffin of perosteum around the artery results in tugging of your um, palatal flap and creates resistance when you try to mobilize the flaps when you may repair. To release it, uh, several techniques have been proposed. Um, you can perform a superperiosteal dissection lateral to the vessel, releasing the remaining fibrous attachments of oral mucosa uh, flap to the bone. This dissection is followed by careful incision of the perusia cone, just media and posterior to the greater palatine vessel. Uh, this will usually um, release the flap, but this procedure um, is technique sensitive and great care will be taken not to injure the greater palatine vessel. Another method is fracturing the, the hamulus, known as hamulotomy. However, this procedure has gained uh, criticism by some authors on the grounds that it may lead to ischian tube dysfunction. Some other authors just simply sublux the tensor tendon around the, the hamulus um, to release the tensor tendon from the hamulus. Um, other authors and other surgeons do a tensor tenopexy. Uh, they incise the tensor tendon just media to his attachments to the pterygoid hamulus. Um, a local a study done by one of our colleagues in Nigeria here um, has advocated the dimple assisted neurovascular bundle um, mobilization as a method for flap mobilization. And he reported that the palatal mucosa can be stretched to separate the greater palatine artery from its perusia coffin by introducing a hemostat in a closed position um, into tissues posterior to the dimple in the palate via a lateral incision, which is just usually posterior to the maxillary tuberosity. And by use of blunt dissection and gently opening of the mucostats to raise the palatal mucosa, the greater palatine artery can be separated from his um, perusial coffin. So these methods can be used to mobilize your flap to achieve a tension-free tension closure. Um, the soft palate dissection, like we said, does the oral mucosa and the oral mucosa is, is separated off the levator muscle using the minor salivary glands as a, your depth of dissection. Dissection of the nasal mucoperistium usually begins at the posterior region of the heart palate using uh, a right-angled um, perusia elevator. Yes, so perusia undermining is carried along the posterior edge of the heart palate onto the medial aspect of the medial pterygoid. And the nasal mucosa is mobilized from there onto the palatal shells using wide superficial undermining, which facilitates a tension free closure of the nasal. Send your questions to the chat box. All questions should be sent to the chat box. Thank you. Now, in patients with a bilateral cleft palate, you can actually use the anterior vuma flap. Uh, starting at the anterior edge of the cleft and extending to the junction of the hard and soft palate, which can be used to close the nasal lining. Uh, and it's a good um, option to achieve a tension free closure in the nasal mucosa. When dissecting uh, the muscles of the soft palate, it's best done using uh, a 3.5 magnification loops so that you can visualize the muscles properly and the neurovascular structures that run uh, along some of those muscles. Now, a combination of sharp and blunt dissection is usually used to elevate and split the palatoglossus and palatopharyngeus fibers uh, that usually lie above the tensor belly palatini. And once you have seen the levator, which is usually um, 
seen as a discrete significant muscle. Um, you can use uh, sharp dissection to free it from its abnormal attachment on the posterior um, edge of the heart palate. However, some neovascular bundles might run along this muscle and care must be taken uh, not to cause any devascularization when this procedure is done. So you see, I put the elevator muscle from the nasal mucosa by a careful blunt dissection on, and, and this is done laterally until you visualize the hamulus and the medial pterygoid plates. You, may need, you would need to also release the aponosis of the tensor valley muscle, um, which is usually incised from medial to lateral to get um, a, a tension, te tension free closure. So you also separate the oral mucosa from the levator muscle um, by sharp dissection, as previously um, um, highlighted in the other slides. This is so that you can get good medialization of the levator muscle to, in order to reposition it. Now, Andrea Desetor has uh, classified different types of muscle dissections uh, during an intravenous veloplasty due to the controversy as to the extent of dissection that should be done during an IVVP and also for standardization purposes. He classified the various types of dissections into four, type 0 to type 3. And type 0 represents the techniques to end muscle repair is done. The surgeon just closes the oral and the nasal mucosa. Type 1 is an attempt at, at muscle repair, but of course, dissection is not done. As seen here, there is no release from the posterior um, edge of the palate. Type 2 dissections are where partial dissection is done, uh, and he, he divided this into 2A and 2B. And in 2A, the levator is released from the palatal shells, but the dissection is not carried laterally to, to the region of the hamulus or, or medial pterygoid. So what you have is an inverted u sling as a result of that dissection. In the type 2B variant, the levator is dissected from the palate and nasal mucosa, but it is still attached to the oral mucosa, and this creates a, an inverted V muscle sling um, uh, dissection, um, an inverted V muscle sling. In the type 3 dissection, this corresponds to the radical intervalle plasty where complete dissection of the muscle is performed from the palatal shells, the nasal lining, and the oral mucosa, and extended laterally to the hamulus and pterygoid. And this is the recommended um, um, procedure for a, a radical IVVP to achieve optimal results. The nasal mucosa closure is usually performed from anterior to posterior. Uh, you can use absorbable um, uh, sutures, PDS suture can be used. The sutures are usually inverted in a vertical mattress fashion for the nasal lining repair to evert the line of closure into the nasal passageway, and this ensures um, mucosa to mucosa contact for optimal healing. The muscle closure, the two pair levator muscles can be are sutured uh, using a furrow vicro, and the sutures are placed on the surface. And care must be taken that uh, there shouldn't be too much tension on your closure um, when you are doing the muscle uh, closure. Muscle closure after intravenous veloplasty effects on speech have been reported by several authors. Sonalad has reported that significant speech improvements in patients who have received radical IVVP as a secondary procedure have been uh, are found. Under this has also reported that the two flower palatoplasty, when it is combined with an IVVP, significantly improves speech outcomes than doing the two flap palatoplasty alone and it may reduce the need for secondary speech surgeries. 
closure of the uh, arm mucosa is done with vesicular material sutures for vehicle can be used. Obstruction of the dead space is achieved by suturing the nasal and oral layer with vesicular material sutures in the region of the junction of the hard and soft palate, just anterior to your muscle repair. Uh, this prevents dead space, and those sutures can also keep your muscle in its posterior position. The oral mucosal layer can be reinforced with continuous locking sutures, as I know my colleagues in Confuanoche usually do, and um, usually this is a reinforcement in case one or two of your vertical uh, mortal sutures should slip. After complete closure, you, you assess the lateral gutters you've created and as much as possible, you try to close them. But if it is not possible to close them primarily, you can place new sutures to reduce the raw bone area, those sutures. And any raw bone area can also, you can put a hemostatic sponge using surgical uh, in that area, which is also sutured and left in place. So this is a picture showing surgical outcome using the two-flap autoplasty technique in a 29-year-old female who had an acquired cleft of the uh, palate with the exposure of the, of the vomer bone and uh, with a, a very nice outcome supportively. She was also screened for uh, syphilis. She came out VDRL negative and so on. She claimed that she, she noticed breakdown in the palate area after she had sustained trauma uh, some time ago. Now the two flat paratoplasty can be associated with complications like any other cleft repair and these complications include um, bleeding, respiratory infection, respiratory obstruction infection with the sense, fistula formation of flat necrosis. Uh, significant postoperative bleeding is usually rare but when it occurs it may lead to intubation and expiration to achieve hemostasis, especially when you are doing the procedure in a child. Um, respiratory obstruction um, may occur because of increase in airway resistance. Um, a natural trumpet may be used postoperatively. I know my colleagues in Ghana uh, usually place a natural trumpet. The area of uh, any patient post palatoplasty should be monitored very carefully in the recovery room. And only after adequate assessment uh, of the oxygen saturation of the patient should the patient be transferred uh, to the wards. Fistulas may present and may result in speech problems or natural regurgitation. Um, Meticulous surgical technique to create uh, well-perfused flaps that are well approximated across the cleft and attention-free is a good prophylaxis against uh, fistula formation. Uh, flap necrosis is a disastrous outcome of this procedure and the risk is more with the two flap palatoplasty because it is a pedicle flap that is just based on the beta palata in your vascular bundle. Um, Disruption of the neurovascular bundle uh, can cause flap necrosis. Other causes include compression or tension, or excessive stretching, stretching, or vascular thrombosis involving the greater palatine artery. Now, some authors have proposed that um, surgical injury to this greater palatine pedicle uh, does not necessarily mean or result in flap necrosis. And they claim that this is because of the continued perfusion of the heart palate via the anastomosis of the greater palatine artery with the, with the ascending palatine artery. But however, to, to guarantee the blood supply from this anastomosis, uh, limited dissection of the soft palate should be done once uh, there has been disruption of the greater palatine neovascular bone. In conclusion, the two-flap palatoplasty 
It is a reliable technique that has yielded acceptable surgical and speech outcomes. It is recommended for parental clefts wider than its limiters. A successful two-flap flap palatoplasty requires good preoperative planning, meticulous surgical technique to create intact and well perfused flaps, and flaps should be carefully approximated across, across the cleft with minimal tension and adequate postoperative care is a necessity. Uh, this is my team, uh, microfacial surgery team at the Obafemia Olowo University Teaching Hospital Complex. In this era of COVID-19, everybody should stay safe. <laughs> These are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph, for keeping to time. And you have done justice to the topic. So we are very grateful to you. There are several people on the chat box congratulating you for a very brilliant presentation. We have a few questions which we'll discuss. Um, Adewale says the tensor tendon can also be can also be released of the hamulus with the use of a hook. This is his contribution. And then Dr. Achebe says, what do you consider as the main the main advantage of Bada procedure over Langenbeck? That is his first. Uh, question. If you can handle that, we will continue. Okay. Should I respond to the question? Yes. Okay. It's a two-part question, so you answer this one first. Okay. So, the main advantage of Badak over Lagenberg is that it allows you to medialize your flaps and have a relatively tension-free closure when you are dealing with wide collateral threats. That is one. Secondly, the access created by the badat to flap palatoplastic procedure allows you uh, precise dissection of your soft palatal musculature to allow for repositioning of this uh, levator valley palatine muscle to achieve optimal speech and functional outcomes post-surgery. Uh, those are the two main advantages of the Badak procedure over the Lagenberg procedure. Okay, thank you. The, the second question is, in which vocal classification would you recommend the Badak technique? Now, uh, the VO classifies clefts into four classes clefts of the soft palate, clefts of the soft and hard palate, unilateral, complete clefts of the lip and palate, and bilateral, complete clefts of the lip and palate. Now, um, various authors have various recommendations. Some authors will say once you have a bilateral uh, palate, you can use a badak. However, some other authors have, have said that a bilateral palate is uh, prone to tissue hypoplasia. And so, uh, once you have tissue hypoplasia, uh, you, you are best using another technique. Tissue hypoplasia also comes with vascular hypoplasia as well. So, but for me, I have had very successful outcomes using the Badak uh, technique for particularly white clefts, whether bilateral or unilateral clefts, irrespective of the vocal classification. Okay. 
Thank you very much. The next question is, what is the common do you experience using the other techniques? Um, do I experience that? That would be a personal uh, question. Well, for the Badak technique, I have not actually had uh, any complications either than you. You have very you, sometimes you can have very wide lateral waters, which behind by certain tension and could predispose uh, to maxillary growth restriction sometimes. Um, however, flap ne necrosis is the most dreaded complication of the badak to flap palatoplasty. Um, fortunately enough, I, I, I have not experienced that yet. Maybe I've been practicing for too short a time. <laughs> but uh, the flap necrosis is the, is the most dreaded complication. Uh, thank you. Uh, Somebody is also asking, how early? Can you use this technique? Okay. Um, the technique can be used um, between 9 to 12 months. In our center, the protocol is to, to operate this patient between 9 to 12 months. Of course, we are trying to balance um, getting a vela repair for this patient before the development of speech at 18 months, as well as minimizing the effects of maxillary growth restriction by doing the, the cleft surgery too early. Uh, so, doing between 9 to 12 months, uh, this technique. Uh, thank you. Another question is, can this method be used when any other methods have failed? Yes, it, it, it can be used, but we must also um realize that once you are doing the secondary palatoplasty you're going to have some degree of fibrosis so the, the tissues may not move uh, as to do the primary palatoplasty and then you must be very sure that the vascular ped pedicle that's the greater palatine the vascular bundle is intact when you are doing the secondary palatoplasty you don't know what has Except you are the one who did the primary palatoplasty, you cannot guarantee that except you do a, 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 a dupla or transomography to confirm that. Because that flap in a badak would definitely depend on, on the greater palatine in vascular bundle. So yes, it can be used. And um, it can be used. It can be used. Yes, it can. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, there are a lot of uh, charts in the chat room all congratulating you for a very brilliant uh, presentation. In fact, most of them are all congratulating you. Only a few people ask questions. So I also joined them to, to congratulate you for a very brilliant presentation. You have done, you have really done justice to the topic and your illustrations are excellent. And I hope uh, people will try if they are not being using, I use the technique very often. But if others are not using, I will encourage them from your presentation so that they can also uh, use it. So thank you very much for enlightening you, us uh, this morning. Um, yes, I, I think uh, I'll hand you over to Enki for uh, further comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Raphael for this beautiful presentation. It's very clear and the content is very educative. So well done. And Dr. Emmanuel, I do for this moderation. I want to thank every participant for this first series of our teleclip. By next week, we'll be going to the second series, which also promises to be more exciting than this first series. And that series we take weeks presentation from July. So we hope that the attendance has been very encouraging. 
Yesterday, yeah. all attendees were advised to send that the form will be sent to them via email. The CME forms will be sent to them via email for them to complete and indicate the sessions they attended, which will be validated before award of credit to be given. So once again, I want to thank SmileTrain for facilitating this and West African College of Surgeons for this wonderful partnership to continue to improve our capacity. And I wish that all of us have benefited tremendously from this series and we we'll look forward to the next series. So once again, I want to say thank you. I think Esther has uh, uh, an announcement to make for an upcoming webinar. So Esther, I'll allow you to say that so that everybody will know about the coming webinar this Friday. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you, Professor Debola. Thank you very much, Dr. Azuka. That was a beautiful presentation. And thank you, Professor Emmanuel, for the moderation. I just want to invite everyone uh, for a virtual town hall that will happen on 9th July on telemedicine. There was a question yesterday on how SmileTrain can support telemedicine for speech therapy. So please register through the link I've shared in the chat. Uh, just copy it now so that when the meeting closes, it doesn't disappear. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week, same time.